Hi, my name is Gal Lawrence and thanks for tuning into my podcast today. If you're enjoying these conversations and you want to check out more of this transformational work, be sure to come back to guylawrence.com.au and join me as we go further down the rabbit hole. Enjoy the show. Doria, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Now, I have to say, I can't even remember if we spoke about this or not, but I, I actually have an ice bath every week, right? And, and I turn up and there's a crowd of us between five or 10 people. So you can imagine the minds of people that actually want to go on ice bath every week. They're pretty open, right? And somebody clocked me and the pendant, the biogeometry pendant I was wearing. Oh, really? and, they said, and they said to me, oh, what's that? And then I went to, and I just said, oh, it's biogeometry pendant. And then of course they said, what's that? And I was like, you know what, let me record a podcast and I'll get back to you. So that's, <laughs> what, the, that's what this is about today, for sure. So, you know, I, I wish I could tell you that I sometimes don't feel like giving the same answer. So I can so we'll imagine. See, we'll see how it goes. We can see how it goes. But I always ask everyone, you know, if you were on, say, an airplane, you sat next to a complete stranger and they said, what do you do? How do you normally answer that then? You know, um, when we talk about biogeometry, there's, there's two ways, uh, I feel, to, to look at it. As a broad picture, when we say what is biogeometry, you know, we say it's, um, uh, if, if you look at the actual words uh, and we break down their meaning, you know, it translates into life measurement of the earth. That's where that word actually comes from. Now, going back to where geometry and bio, but what we actually do is we work with a design language of shapes. And so a lot of times, if you go back and you look at the types of, or, or today, you don't have to go back, the types of healing modalities or centering modalities that are very, um, that are common, you could think of things such as sound healing, right? Or color yeah. therapy. But very few people would know what you're speaking about if you say shape therapy. Um, but what biogeometry actually offers is through what we call the physics of quality. We offer a language of breaking down every vibrational, um, every vibrational effect into its effect on the body. So what that means is if I look at sound, smell, touch, taste, I don't look at them separate, but I look at them as if we, we, we distinguish between absolute reality and perceived reality. And I look at them as basically an absolute reality where I, where I have the soup of energy and then perceived reality is the effects that my brain is picking up. So and the, so the quantitative effect of everything coming in to give you that data, if you like. Yeah, exactly. Right. So very few of us stop and think about that. What is actually the world that we live in is being created in our brain. So when we talk about, you know, the energy of shape, the energy of color, the energy of sound, a lot of people aren't even, or of course they're aware, but they don't keep in mind that how do you make this reality? Well, that shape, that color, that sound, that touch, that taste has to have an effect on your body. And in order for you to be able to translate it. So there's two components to that. Obviously there's your sensory experience, but then there's that centering healing aspect of it. And you can break it down to any sensory experience. It's not really limited to sound and color, even though I would say those are the most common. Got it. Got it. I think I, I, think I got it. Because <clears throat> I want to I wanna make this interpretation in my head as well for listeners. Because um, when speaking to you before, you, you raised a really important point about the subtle energy. And, and like I said, um, we spoke before, but I've had meditative states where I've expanded beyond myself and, and become something greater than myself. So when I translate back into the human experience, I always feel and see myself as subtle energy, but in this mammal, this vessel, having a human experience and that, that quantitative data is coming in. And then I put interpretation to it to allow me to have the 3D human experience right now. Now, on saying that, then I feel like the, the subtle energy that's the fabric that, that, the, um, that gives rise to reality, if you like, 
uh, I look at it as myself in a fishbowl. I'm a fish, but I'm not aware of the environment because I'm already in it and I don't know it's there. And I know you spoke to that. Yeah, I mean, it. what I was saying is when, when we spoke about it, I said, um, you know, I just said it's, it's a very uh, kind of interesting vision that you give because in my, um, my father, who's actually the founder of Biogeometry, in his new book that's going to be coming out, he has a little um, illustration. And basically, it's Dr. Fish sitting in the lab trying to make water. And he's saying that basically this is what we're, we're doing with, with subtle energy. It is a type of free energy. It is that background universal weave that we can tap into. Uh, and if, so shape is a type of free energy. And so that's one of the things, you know, we, we have a lot of, um, we, there's different shapes that we work with that we place in environments. And because they deal with that background subtle energy weave, there's no type of recharging needed. There's no type of expiration date. But you actually said something that is, that talks, that's very important as to actually why I think the study of shape is, um, or the study of the shape of, or working with the energy of shape is really distinguishing from other types of, like we said, vibrational modalities, is you, you said when you're meditating that you get this um, experience, or not this experience, you actually do, you know, like you're, going out, expanding yourself into the absolute and coming back into this body, this vessel. So one of the things that we actually, the premise when we look at the body to start with, so, so going back to the shape of the body and going back to um, a lot of, when we look at biogeometry, the worldview of biogeometry is very holistic and right brain, very similar to ancient civilizations. But the first thing we do when we look at the human body is we look at what is the purpose of the shape of the human body. And the conclusion that we come to is the purpose of the shape of the human body, and you've just said it, is to house energy. So that's where we begin to unlock some of the secrets of the human body. And I think one of the things that we actually spoke about is even um, when, we look at, when we look at ancient Egypt, when I say we spoke about, we spoke about before. Um, when we look at the shape of the human body, if we go back to ancient Egypt, they have what we would call the archetypal images or the human body drawn in very specific proportions. Now we say why these specific proportions and what we actually find is when you draw the human figure within those same archetypal proportions, we are actually able to detect an increase of energy qualities on the shape. It doesn't have to be a human being, an increase of energy or what we would call um, a centering energy quality where the chakras are. So it actually expanded our understanding where now we understand that these energy centers of the body are actually created through the shape of the body, which of course gives a whole new meaning to even the position you take when you're meditating because you're shaping the body with the way that you sit. Wow. How, how do you come about to doing this? Because somebody's had to figure all this out. In the first place. It wasn't me. <laughs> so, um, um, no, so basically, I mean, I was, I was born into this. So maybe I can, I'll step back and, and get a little bit personal, talk about our family. Please, yeah. And uh, so my, my father um, is an, uh, he's an architect and a professor of architecture. And when uh, my grandfather is also, um, an architect, so he was, uh, their firm basically did a lot of city and town planning for a lot of the cities in the Middle East and Europe. He was the first modern architect to, uh, in, um, in Egypt. And my father graduated in architecture and started working with him. In his later years, uh, my grandfather also started being drawn to esoteric ancient Egypt. Or okay. when I say es esoteric ancient Egypt, it's the feeling that you know that there is more than what we're seeing, you know, in the books and the facts or what you're seeing when you just go on a, on a regular day-to-day -day tour in Egypt, which is a feeling, of course, that most people have. And so he started um, going deep. So he was an Egyptologist in his own right. So my father, when he graduated, he was in, he graduated from uh, ETH, the technical school in Zurich, also in town planning. And there was a lot of different serendipitous events that got him to develop biogeometry. One of them was 
there was a very firm request that somebody kept sending for my father to basically they were um, remodeling the one of an, an ancient Egyptian museum. So I believe it was an ancient Egyptian museum dedicated to medicine. Mm -hmm. And at that time, you know, my father had just graduated. He was working directly uh, with my grandfather. So he, he wasn't, he, he didn't have the time for it, but they kept kind of pushing, saying, well, you have to be the one to do this. And then they started showing him. So like I said, of course he was open to everything, but it wasn't his original path, just coming from that, that background I told you with my grandfather. So, you know, they showed him, um, some instruments that are uh, pendulum instruments or different types of energy symbols that you have from ancient Egypt. And at that time, he, he didn't, um, he was always, like I said, open-minded, but he just said this wasn't being an engineer. This wasn't the type of work that he necessarily felt would be the path that he would be taking. And so somebody told him, or this, the same person who had, um, was kind of pushing for him to do the museum and telling him this is part of your path told him there is actually a physics or what they would call at that time, what later became known as a micro vibrational physics uh, by, by what we would call French redesthesists. There is a type of classification system using pendulums that deals with wavelengths. And that is not just a dialogue with the subconscious. So he told him, go to, um, he gave him, and he told him when you're, when you go to France, uh, I'm going to go to the Maison de Redesthesie, so that's a, it's a redesthesia shop. And when you go there, ask for these books. So my father said, okay, because he wasn't planning on going to France. And then a few weeks later, he got sent to France for work. Wow. And so again, when he was there, it also took him a few days, you know, he was concentrating on work. It took him a few days to finally make his way to the shop. He went and he asked for these books. And, you know, the, the shopkeeper said, I, I don't know what you're speaking about. We, we only have what's called um, the mental dowsing redesthesia test, which is basically how to develop uh, a dialogue with the subconscious and gain information, which is, um, which, which in its own right is also a very deep field of knowledge that you can um, dive deeply into, but it wasn't, uh, it's, it's not the same type of measurement we use in biogeometry. So then a woman heard him uh, speaking and said, uh, she said, are you the Egyptian? Where have you been? We've been waiting for you for three days. And then she told him, follow me. And she took him uh, to, to, the, to a back store and she gave him all of the original, what we call the school of French redesthesia, all of the original texts and said this information was um, it got buried or it wasn't, you know, deeply, it didn't continue this work, but we know that it's an Egyptian who's going to be reviving this science or who's going to be bringing it to the next era. And so when he got this body of work, it's, I think it's a very significant that he's an architect and not a physician. Because when he got this body of work, he was already aware of a lot of different subtle energy um, sciences or approaches out there. And all of them not only have classification systems, they have thousands of years of applications behind them. So what this body of work allowed him to do is it would classify a lot of energy effects into colors. So what I mean is, um, let's assume that very simple example. Let's assume that you know there's an issue in, in the digestive system and we, we can then classify, we have wavelengths for specific colors and we classify each organ function into the color it's most in resonance with. And then the ones that are out of balance, we can actually give it the opposite color and try to bring it back into balance. So Again, that's just a simple example, but, and then there's the same thing where if you go into classification systems, you have female male, right? So that was a lot of ancient Egypt, you had female male energy, positive negative polarity, yin yang mm -hmm. energy. So when he got this, this system, he knew that he didn't want to go down the path of developing another diagnosis system for the subtle energy, because First of all, like he said, you're at that point you're you're dealing with it's there, it exists. You know, if you go into into TCM, you have vast amounts of information. 
So he started looking as an architect. And this is where I said the significance of being an architect comes in. And this is also why I mentioned that him and my uh, grandfather had done a lot of the planning of cities. So looking at architecture and from the history of architecture, he very much looked at why is it that civilizations change, but the spots that they are drawn to, the spots upon which their community evolves from doesn't change. And these spots are areas around the world that are used for pilgrimage, that are used for healing. But more importantly, when we place an energy system in one of those locations, we no longer worry about classifying energy because that location in itself has secrets that bring the energy system into balance. And that those are what became known as power spots, areas where you can experience the centering energy quality, which sometimes leads to healing, which leads mm -hmm. to oracles. What would be examples of those places? Just for everyone. Um, I mean, I'm going to say the pyramids. Of course. <laughs> so just, just being in Egypt, I'm going to say the pyramids. But if you go to a lot of the ancient sites, right? So if you go to ancient temples, you will always find them taking into account these um, energy lines and actually building where the most sacred area of the site is built on the, uh, on the, what we would call the major power spot crossings. And then you also find, I mean, the way that we, um, that we look at it in history is actually how these spots were identified and, um, and, and marked. So in the beginning, how these spots probably were identified. I mean, when we go into ancient man, one of the things we talk about a lot is it's very difficult. The reason it's very difficult for us to unlock a lot of the secrets of ancient man is because we are looking at the world through our perspective, where we look at, if we look at um, ancient man being very much caught in a right brain perception and seeing the world as more, more holistic, you know, for, for all we know, they saw energy, right? So they could have even seen these locations. And I'm saying, for example, there's a, a TED talk called A Stroke of Insight, where it's, um, I think she's a neuroscientist and her perception switches into the right brain. And she starts to be able, she says, I can't see where my body ends and the environment begins. And you can, you can see that she's starting to see energy. But more than that, you, these are also locations where, like I said, you have healing, you have all of these oracles, locations that animals are drawn to. Um, locations that, uh, so for example, um, a lot of, if you have, um, if you have a dog, dogs are mostly drawn to, if that power spot energy exists in your own home, you may yeah, find right. if your dog is feeling unwell, they would automatically go to those locations. Um, with cats, it's a little bit tricky because cats, their body actually allows them to transmute negative energy for themselves from the earth. So it's a little bit different. They're not automatically always going straight to the power spots, but dogs will. And so this is where, for example, they would look at where animals migrated to, where you had um, birds circling where even where you would have, so one of the uh, sites in, in Egypt, the citadel, the site is said to have been chosen that they basically um, took a meat and hung it around Cairo and they chose the location where the meat stayed the freshest, the longest. Now, of course, we can say there's probably a lot of factors, you know, if we look at oxygen, if we look at different parts of these locations, I'm sure today we would analyze it in a more quantitative way. But basically to them, it was the locations where everything was thriving. And when we see these power spots, how they were marked, and this goes into as well into church planning. So if you go to Europe, almost all of the churches are built on power spots. And you can see also in a lot of different um, German texts. So a lot of the information when we talk about earth energy comes from a German background. Um, a lot of those German texts even have the, you can see the depictions where they're marking the lines and building the power spot, uh, building the church right on the strongest power spot crossing. And so I'll, 
speak quickly, but basically, if we look at how these sites were first marked, it would be with large megalithic stones, you know, usually with a very high quartz content to radiate that energy. And then we see also um, what we would call a dolmen, a gate structure, a lot of times being placed on the power spots. And this would usually be covered, or not usually, but a lot of times it could be covered with a hill, giving you that sacred hill, or even, you know, the, the culmination takes us to the Giza pyramids, where the king's chamber actually becomes that gate structure inside. Mm -hmm. And then the pyramid covers that. So you find these locations all over the world. And one of the things that um, I like about the work that we do is that we actually teach people how to find them locally. And um, it's because, it, you know, you, you're not always able to get to those huge ones that are marked. And, and you know, even if it's um, a, a smaller power spot, once you can measure that energy, that centering energy quality, which is the cornerstone of biogeometry, that's how we work. How could it, you know, we had to go back and see if we're going to work with energy. What is the one type of energy that we can basically expose everybody to? that contains within it what we call those, going back to now ancient Egypt, when we talked about the archetypal human being, that contains within it those archetypal laws that helps center any energy system multidimensionally. And that's where it comes to that special vortex energy we find in sacred power spots. Right, wow. There's a lot to digest there. There's, a, there's, <laughs> there's something that, that jumped out at me as well, because because you mentioned the word healing and uh, the, these healing places. And I know ancient civilizations certainly had a different interpretation of healing to what the Western medicine is today. And, and also, um, I, I'm trying to think what you mentioned earlier, because, because Western medicine is based on parts diagnosis. Oh, you've got that problem, let's fix that. But never really looking at the, the root causes beyond the symptoms. And, and I was just, wouldn't mind you speaking to just to your interpretation of how it can be healing overall? I mean, what comes to mind is um, if we look back at ancient Egypt and I, I, I forget, and I think it's actually the same thing if you look back into uh, Chinese medicine, but the first doctor or the, the highest position of the doctor was the physician that actually helped you not get sick. It was, and it was basically, I mean, I, I the, the, there was, it went into three levels and it was the third one that was basically the one that you went to when you went sick, but it meant that something was, was wrong or something was off. It was the last one. And I think if we look at our society today, it's actually the opposite where we're giving uh, preventative medicine doesn't have enough of a stage in the sense that it, it doesn't have enough of a stage because we look at the body as basically a computer and with time, something is gonna have a wear and tear and we just assume, you know, it's gonna happen. It's genetic, it's I don't know what, it's what. But one of the things, I mean, that, that comes to mind is being a professor of, of architecture, my father is actually able to have many students graduate having their thesis done in biogeometry. And mostly the way that this happens is it'll be a lot of architecture and interior design students. They'll want to design a study using biogeometry to talk about healing spaces. And because of his position, a lot of the professors will allow for the study and just ask my father to come in as a supervising independent professor to ask the questions, guide the student. And one of the studies that was actually done, which was very interesting, was there was a student who designed um, it was like a, a strip that you can put in the base of a room or you can put kind of as a mold. And the idea was that this would help in spaces. I mean, she was really targeting spas, but also things like addiction centers, um, different things like that and creating that most relaxing space. So a lot of times when we approach spaces now, there's a study of what we call the psychology of the space, but it's very vague. It's kind of in the sense that you know, we feel connected and well in nature, so let's bring in nature into the home, but which is, which is a, a wonderful premise, but then let's go back and look at the energy of nature and make sure we're recreating it. So with this strip, when she designed it, you know, my father said, well, the, the, it can't just be a thesis of this space should be relaxing. How do we show that? 
So we had her call the medical department. And the reaction of the medical department was what I, I wanted to get to here, where you know the, the professor who's a friend of my father called them and said, stop sending us your design students. This is the medical department. And he said, but my students are designing homes for people to live in. And they're getting results. So if they're not getting results, then we can entertain this argument. But if they're getting results, then aren't they a form of preventative medicine? Anyway, so back and forth, the medical department said, fine, we will help with this study. Um, we're not going to take anybody off of medication. So they actually helped her do the study with uh, mice and serotonin levels. And they found compared to two of the drugs that are, um, well, to two drugs and one which is a combination of the two drugs being used on the market for raising serotonin levels. And they found that um, we basically scored better, that just using that strip scored better than two of the drugs and just as equal in, in uh, helping normalize those serotonin levels as that combination. Mm -hmm. And so, and that was actually with the strip, they placed it in a way where it's actually, they put it outside of the cage. So we think the effect would have been better inside. And so it's these types of conversations where we're showing that your environment or that space can actually help to normalize those serotonin levels. Um, but you can study it. We need to bring science into studying the spaces that we're living of in a course. bit more. And so, yeah, I mean, when we talk about healing, I, I, think, I think the big aspect of it too is just thinking of the human body as multidimensional. Which and, most people don't. No. And yeah. so, you know, I, I think it, we do in the sense maybe now that we talk about stress can lead to disease. Stress can lead to lowering your immune function. Um, I, unfortunately, I think a lot of the mainstream approaches to stress tend to cause more stress <laughs> in the sense of if you don't deal with your stress, then um, you know, you're affecting your health, you're affecting your relationships. But I think what we don't look at is, um, you know, in, in, it, it used to be when we used to teach, we used to spend so much time explaining to students this concept of energy exchange with the environment. They were in constant energy exchange with the environment on emotional, mental, vital, and spiritual levels. And it still felt like we were explaining things in a way that wasn't right. So in the end, we said, you know what, forget, forget what we're saying. What we're trying to tell you is you are the environment. And we went back to actually, you know, doing um, different types of measurements on the same person when they're facing different directions. You see a shift in their energy. Mm. We, we did measurements on, of course, when you do a measurement on the power spot location, you see that sense of homeostasis coming back into the subtle energy system. We did the types of measurements where, um, you know, somebody will be uh, doing a diagnosis um, in class. So somebody was doing that, uh, I forgot what it's called, that 12 pulse diagnosis system. And, you know, my, my father was slowly scooting a cable towards the person's uh, leg that was being diagnosed. And you could hear the practitioner going, oh, wait, you know, the, the energy is changing. And Amazing. so it's this concept where, you know, a plant, if a plant isn't well, do you sit and try to inject it with chemicals or do you try to, to put it in a location where maybe it's getting more sunlight, maybe it's getting more water. And, and I think that's where we just need to change our relationship with the environment to understand you know, I, I see a lot of, um, there's a lot of interest lately in a lot of retreats or creating these locations that are supposed to be healing to your energy system. But what they're actually missing is that, and there's locations that can be healing to your energy system and it's not necessarily, um, you don't have to do anything. So what I mean is a lot of times to, get a healing location, we say we have to meditate there or we're going to eat a certain type of um, diet, or, which is mm. great. But what if we tell you that if you just go to, to this location, if you can measure those centering spaces and make use of them and connect to them, 
they'll do it for you. They'll change the way you think. They'll start bringing your energy system into balance. And of course, then if you start meditating in those locations, it becomes a whole different type of experience. It's a whole new ball game. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, okay. So what's coming to mind then is where we spend most of our time at home or, or in the office or, or whatever. So it makes sense, total sense to set up our environment in a way that's supported, not, 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 um, affecting us for the negative where we're always fighting, you know, we're always pushing shit uphill as they say. <laughs> yeah, right. So yeah. with biogeometry, are we recreating what the sacred spots are doing that are out there in the world? Or do I have to go and wander with, with my pendulum and that to find the spot? Or can I no, recreate that in the home? You can create it. I mean, what we've developed is like I said, a design language. I mean, one of the first things of course, as an architect is, able to detect the energy of sacred power spots. Okay, how do shapes come into play, right? And right. this is where we said, you know, you have yeah. shapes of the human body. We actually found, and this is where it becomes interesting. So the same energy of a sacred power spot location, when I spoke about the chakras, the same energy of the sacred power spot location is what we find in the body's chakras. It's this, they're in resonance. So it shows us you can't create this environment where we're completely removed from these energy centers in the body and these energy centers in the environment and their interaction. They're interacting all the time, whether we're, aware, whether we're aware of it or not. So we do work on, you know, the, the creating those locations in the home. But one of the things I'll, I'll recommend is, you know, I'm sure a lot of your listeners do different types of activities at home, such as meditating. One of the big recommendations is meditate in especially, especially if you've been meditating for a while, meditate in different locations in your home. See the difference when you do that. Mm. You know, a lot, we, we had one, um, we had one uh, uh, client or, or friend we were, work, we were talking to and she was saying, you know, we've been meditating for 10 years. It comes so naturally and easy to my husband. And when I try to meditate, it's, uh, it's, it's still, it's still not as common. There's still a little sense of agitation and it's been years. And we checked the area where he was meditating and the area where she was meditating. And she was actually meditating on what we would call um, a, a geopathic stress line. And we just moved her off of it and it completely shifted her practice. Wow. So, I mean, one of, we, we, we try to, to tell people how they can, create these sacred spaces. I mean, we do have um, what we, we have the biogeometry home kit, which is actually designed for the home. We have four places and four things that you can actually like meditation. We, we even have a music CD that recreates that energy quality. If you just leave it in the background, it doesn't even have to be very odd. Like it could be um, hmm. the, the volume. It needs to have a volume, but it can be very low. But one of the things I'll tell you to try is um, when we look at, so, you know, first we started off by trying to bring in where I said, you know, colors are um, color therapy, sound therapy. You know, if you say that, everybody's going to be with us. Shape therapy, people are going to stop you and be like, I'm not so sure. Maybe lately with things like, um, you know, the flower of life being, uh, you know, a, a lot more people kind of getting interested to that and sacred geometry, which is different from biogeometry. Maybe we can have a bridge to, to energy of shape. Of course, energy of shape as well. We talk about the pyramids, you know, look at any type of um, people who work with crystals, people who create organ, pyramid, uh, organ shapes. A lot of times they're dealing with uh, pyramids. But now what if we talk about number therapy, right? So okay. that's a whole... That's a whole different um, ballgame, right? But, but numbers, so again, you know, what makes, um, if we look at colors, we can say, you can differentiate between red and blue. So red has an effect on the brain, blue has an effect on the brain. Well, what if I give you, you know, one stone or two stones? Okay, you can differentiate between one stone and two stones. So they have a different effect on the brain. So we can even use numbers as a type of energy. And when we look at the number of things, so 
one of the, the, the first number that gives us uh, that what we call that centering energy, which we call BG3 is actually 16. The second number is 19. The third is 28. But what you can do is if you're, if you're meditating in kind of outdoors, just try to find a 16 or 19 similar stones and just place them around you in a circle. That will automatically put you into resonance with that centering quality. I'm trying that. I'm definitely trying. It's, it's just blows my mind. And I, t- and I tell you like why, you know, I'm, <clears throat> because I've been working with energy myself a lot more recently, working with people. You know, I, I, I reached out to you and just invited you on the show after listening to you on another podcast saying, oh my God, I've really got to find out more about this stuff. And you were kind enough to send me a, a pendulum and, and, well, two pendulums to wear. Right. And that was, it was the last thing in my mind. I just wanted to pick your brains more than anything. And I, I have a platform to do it, but um, I've been wearing it now for, I don't know, two weeks, maybe two, maybe three weeks, maybe even a month. I'm not sure. And, and Matt, who I work with, who works with sound, he's been working with sound for 17 years. Very tuned in guy, uh, went out and bought one the next day. And he's like, and, and, it, and it arrived similar time. And I swear to God, like every time I would hold space and it was draining and I would work really hard to get my energy back up, but it would normally take me a day or two afterwards when working with other people's emotional subtle energy, because I'm keeping my, my awareness in my heart and in the subtle energy the whole time holding that space. And the, 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 the transformation, I swear to God, has been incredible. Like I've really noticed it. Even my sleep in general is deeper. Um, and, you know, so I think, yeah, so it's this also the same one right here. I think this is yeah. what we sent you. Yeah. And I'm not just saying that because you're like, that. this is what's happening. And it's got me very excited about the possibilities I mean, of it all. I have to say, so a lot of, I mean, just to go into what this, the, the pendant has. That's um, So the pendant is basically, if you look at, um, if you look at uh, the meridian system, for example, these are energy lines that cover the whole body. Yeah. So when we start looking at each organ, you actually find that we can trace, going back to those color wavelength qualities, we can trace energy flows within each organ shape. And so, <sighs> you know, the goal of biogeometry then is, okay, so if we have these shapes and similar shapes will enter into resonance, just like two tuning forks, if, you, if they're the same note will enter into resonance. So we have these shapes that can enter into resonance with functions, energy functions or lines in the body. And then how do we, so the years of research was, but we don't want to study a human body. We want to study that we call that archetypal body, that body that is the shape that is the blueprint upon which we're built. And we want to go back to that. So that's where the years of the research went into, we have these energy flows, we can place the shapes of these energy flows on our own body. And because that, that energy flow exists within us, there's a type of information exchange. Right. And every single shape has been researched or adapted to bring in that center and quality of a power spot into the organ. And what, one of the things you know, that I find that people who experience, a lot of people say, you know, what am I going to experience when I wear the pendant. Is it going to take care of this? Is it going to take care of that? Our answer is always, you know, it, it really depends on the cause, right? Where um, personally, my, one of my biggest issues is um, my posture. And there's a certain energy blockage that I have to keep clearing a lot until I fix my posture. Does it, the pendant is helping where I'm not seeing an energy build up as much as I would and the work that we do. But since the cause is more physical, it becomes a support. But there's a lot of uh, causes that are emotional and mental. So that's why sometimes people will wear the pendant and there'll be an instant reaction. Yeah. Now this goes to when you say holding space or where we see that instant reaction a lot is with people who work with other people. Because a lot of times when you're holding space or in a lot of the locations that we visit to teach, there's been a lot of activities or rituals or things that have to do with the release of energy. Mm -hmm. 
And very few people remember to clear the spaces before they leave. And, or also to clear themselves. So actually one of the shapes, the shape that we have um, here with the pendant, we call it an L90 because it has a 90 degree angle, um, helps do that, helps keep your energy system clear. And I think that's one of the reasons you were, you were feeling that. And then with the other shapes going into different organ functions will even help everybody that you're connected to. Wow. And so it's been one of the things that we, um, you know, I say we because I, it really is kind of, I, I, I teach most of the time I teach with my sister. Um, and then, like I said, you know, my, my, um, my father having developed the science, my brother also um, teaches as well and licenses people for kind of home, uh, home balancing services. But when we teach, one of the things that we have found or we always try to remember is if we don't clear the space before the class starts we can feel it you know even when we if we don't go in and just take a look at the space and clear it the you know the, to, to put it in my my sister's words the one time that we forgot to do it she said it's like there's a cloud you know we, we showed up late and, and we didn't clear the space and she was like there's a cloud a kind of on the space on the students without us even having started any type of energy work and, you know, we, we actually at that point kind of paused the class, gave everybody a break and sat and worked on the space before everyone wow. came back. And it was just a completely different experience. That's amazing. Because I've run, I reckon, 40 workshops in the last 18 months before COVID hit, maybe more. And there would be times, because I'd be working with people all day, you know, and, and um, there'd be times I'd come out of there feeling like I've just been run over by a bus. And then other times I feel great. And I, and I just, and I'm like, what it, like, what is it? Like, what is going on? And I definitely felt that there was the environment, but I, I felt kind of helpless to really be able to um, address that fully, you know? So. I mean, let's, let me, let's, we, there's two things you can start doing right away for that. Um, so we talk a lot about, when it comes to energy, we talk about shifts in time and space. You know, mm -hmm. think about summer equinox, autumn equinox, but even more than those, think about the biggest uh, shift in time we're dealing with every day is um, the sun rising and the sun setting. And this is also a type of uh, perception, going back to that shifting to right brain perception and understanding energy. We try to focus so much because we talked about stress and you know, one of the things that we're finding is causing a lot of stress is actually that our perception of time is left brained, where our perception of time is very much, um, you know, minute after minute after minute, and you're moving to, you know, in a specific one way path. A linear. Way, linear, a linear yeah. type of perception. And we, we talk a lot about the profound effect of just shifting to a cyclical perception of time and seeing every day as that cycle from sunrise to sunset and addressing every day through that you have a little bit of this perception with people who work with the land uh, farmers dealing with seasons but this also ties into we talk about um, so you get a if if you can capture an energy quality or create an energy quality at the start of a cycle it carries through the whole cycle so one of the ways that we make use of this is actually the start of a cycle in your home is the door. That's what we would call your energy key, your main energy key. And if you say a blessing as, and this can be, when I say say a blessing, it can be whatever that means to you. you know, some people just even imagine a white light. If you say it as you walk through the door, that will project in the whole space and walk with your right foot. So the right foot forward has a type of projection effect. The left foot forward has a protective effect. So walk in with your right foot, say that blessing, it'll project in the whole space. So if you have everybody do that as they walk into the space, it will clear it automatically. And so after that, what you can do at the end of the session is have everybody clap. So clapping, will actually clear the space when everybody's huh. done while they're there. So it's, um, you know, the two, two easy things you can, you can implement that will make it easier, easier to hold the space, 
um, you know, easier to, like I said, uh, when they're walking out, but hopefully, you know, I do believe that just, like I said, that L90 shape with the pendant will be enough so that I, you know, I, I would be surprised if you get tired again while, while you have those on. Yeah, well, it's been night and day, honestly. It really has, which is phenomenal. Um, well, what is your hope for biogeometry moving forward? Where's, where does your vision take you with this? I think, uh, I think there's two parts, which is really, uh, you know, the, the, the practical part. We haven't touched on it so much, but a lot of our work, um, and probably the work that we're actually uh, we, the most known for internationally, is that uh, in 2005, there was a cell tower installed in, uh, in, a, in a town in Switzerland. And there was, suddenly there was a lot of health issues coming up, but also a lot of issues with, um, with the cows and with um, a lot of the animals around. And so at that time, my father having graduated, like we spoke about from um, the technical school in Zurich, they asked him if he had um, a solution. And he um, went in and we installed shapes on the actual cell tower antennas. We were lucky because we, at that time, uh, we worked with the mobile provider, Swisscom, and we worked with the local government. So we had all the access we needed. And you know, within a week, all of the symptoms had dissipated. But more than that, it wasn't, when, when we went in, um, so the study was done independently, but when they started looking at the study and talking to people, it was done in terms of talking about all of the symptoms you're experiencing you know, we went in with the understanding that we're going to be dealing with a lot of physical symptoms. I'm not sleeping well, you know, um, yeah. I'm, uh, you know, sometimes a lot of people were talking about neck pain, headaches was a big one, but the, the surprising part, I guess, or, or the, the shocking part was that shift in feeling um, a lot of the mental and emotional answers that came where we weren't even, we weren't thinking of that going in. But you know, a lot of people were saying, I'm, I'm one of the biggest ones was, I find that I have less of a will to live. I wake up less motivated. Um, you know, it's, it's a lot of times, there was a lot more fights between families mm. and we added that to the study. And we, at that time, the residents, you know, they, they didn't understand by geometry, but they were just looking for any solution. And so, you know, when I say a week later that it shifted to people saying, you know, they, they, they accepted the tower being there with the shapes on there, they wouldn't have done that unless all of their symptoms went away. And so a lot of times when we talk about the goal for biogeometry is we actually show the graph when a lot of times when we're going in and people want to know what is it that we can help try to do the goal, like you're saying, is we actually show the study from that, um, that, from that town. We, we actually repeated it in a second town as well in Switzerland, where you see um, basically the number of people suffering from you know, physical or mental symptoms. And you see a graph where the highest is almost everybody has a complaint. It doesn't matter what the complaint is. We basically turned it into what we call the quality of life scale. Everybody has some kind of complaint, whether it's a physical or whether it's a mental or emotional complaint. That was the majority. After we placed the work, the majority of people came out and said, I'm symptom free. Wow. And so, yeah, we don't have the data where this has been done on, in every single um, you know, community or a of large course. Um, million. You know, the, million the, that story made the media, didn't it? Yeah, so it made the yeah. media. You can find it on our mm. site. Um, but most of the time what we come and tell people is we show them the graph before talking about that story. And we say, you know, where would you place yourself and your family and your local community? We haven't had anyone come and tell us that they would place their community into feeling like most people would say they're symptom free. You know, sometimes people will say moderate. Sometimes people will say severe. We've never had people come and say that symptom free. On, on the mental, emotional, physical. Of course, you know, it's, it's gonna be normal that sometimes you're gonna be more tired. Sometimes you're gonna be more, you know, uh, hopefully in time we can create that perfect human state. But our general well-being isn't in this, isn't um, where most people can say, I'm, I'm well, I'm well in every meaning of the word, word mental, emotional, 
And a lot of times as well, when we talk about mental, emotional, we usually are talking about my mental and emotional level. And so that's another thing that we try to say, we have to move away from that. You know, we do clearing exercises and people want to know, what am I going to be clear? We say never. There's a part of you that's connected to the world. We have to change the way we think. And so I guess if that's the goal, it's to bring to, to bring this understanding and this possibility that when we look at the human being multidimensionally, we can get to this state. And you know, one of the best things also in, in Switzerland is, is we have the data not just for people, we have the data for animals, which is also something that we, you know, it's, it's important to consider. You know, a lot of the, the, the cows were having stillbirths. Um, there was, they had to slaughter a lot more cows Jesus. after we did the solution. Um, that stopped, you know, the, the first thing was the bats came back, you know, that was wow. the thing. when they put the cell tower, you know, the, the bats were no longer coming and it was a big deal because the bats are so sensitive that they came back. That's extraordinary. Absolutely yeah. extraordinary. And, w and when, when you think about it, we, we never really consider our environment of how that's affecting our well being. We just don't not, not, you know, not where the way I was raised or, um, people around me, it's like the last place we look. I mean, there's more awareness coming onto it now, but um, that's just extraordinary. That's just extraordinary. There's so many questions I want to ask you. I'm aware we've been going for an hour already, and it's been an incredible podcast. I think I'll have to get you back on at some stage if you're okay with that, Aurea. Yes, I'd, I'd love to anytime. Amazing. Um, look, if people want to learn more, what, what, where would they start? Like, it was, you know, somebody's going to be listening to this and probably just had their mind blown. I went, shit, what do I do? Like, can I learn this stuff? Where's the best, what's, what's the next steps for people? Um, I mean, I'd say if you want to dive deeply into it, there's two books. So there's, there's two things we actually spoke about, um, which is, uh, let's say if you want a little bit more of the science part, what I just said is the physics of quality. There's a book called Back to a Future for Mankind. Mm -hmm. um, and if the, the, the author is my father, Dr. Kareem. And then if you want to learn more about these shapes and the pendant we've been speaking about, there's actually the book by Geometry Signatures. Um, actually, I, I also have a coloring book that I made using these shapes. And that's, that's been a fun experience and getting that feedback because I made it for myself in the beginning. And then, you know, I said, you know, a lot of people were asking when, when they saw it. And so there's been a lot of um, wonderful feedback from that as well. And then just the website by geometry.com. Amazing. And is there anything you would like to leave our listeners to ponder on over after everything we've covered today? I mean, I think, um, I think just the, what we spoke about is, is being aware that there's, you know, like you said, a lot of people aren't uh, aware of the environment. I think also as we grow more aware of the environment, our approach isn't necessarily uh, a holistic approach. So being aware of that subtle energy exchange, going back to that fish in the fishbowl. You know, we, we're sitting trying to create water, we're living with it, the way we enter into resonance with it um, is, is very important. And so, you know, it, being, like I said, I think one of the best things for, for your audience is a lot of them are probably meditating. A lot of them are probably doing a lot of these exercises for their subtle energy system. And a lot of them probably, because they have a background in this, would be sensitive enough to, to see changes in every different location. Even if it's not changing locations, change directions. Try meditating once towards north. Try meditating south, east, west. See what you feel and find the location that works best for you. Even if you're not doing it with measurement the way that we would normally be doing it, it's a start to start being aware of the environment. Perfect. Yeah, beautiful. Doria, thank you so much for coming on the show today. I thank deeply appreciate it. Me. That was incredible. And uh, thank I'll, you for having me. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks.